Brother Luke, a Sin City preacher. Welcome to another episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And this is the second part of the series we're doing. Uh, the, the subject is uh, Old Testament pictures and shadows of Jesus' blood atonement. And uh, first let me just uh, introduce here the people on the panel. Uh, we've got other people who are trying to get on, but as usual there's technical problems. So but right now we have with us Brother Salam, who his YouTube channel is Young Baptist 07. And, and we have uh, Tanya, Sister Tanya, and her channel is Galaxy Dreams 3. So uh, I hope you, everybody watching will, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe to their channels. Uh, uh, you will not be disappointed if you do. Now, before we move on, I'm going to give you a brief summary of what we covered in the first episode. I'm going to condense uh, two hours uh, down into about maybe three minutes. Okay? Uh, this whole series is based upon this premise. I'm quoting, quote, and, and hey, we have, uh, Brother Mitch. Yes. Hey, he made it. Okay. Fantastic. All you got to do is <laughs> get a little more light on your face. Excellent. Now, you got to click on your, uh, your um, um, button that says... Um, uh, it looks like a microphone. microphone. You It'll have a microphone button right underneath your screen. You got to click on that so your microphone works. And, well, actually, once you get set up, settled down to a spot, we'll, we'll tell you. Okay, can you speak? Let's hear you speak. Say something. <laughs> All you got to do is get a little more light on your face. All right, I'll see if I can get some more light on my face. <laughs> okay, that's good. Now, brother. The volume on your um, uh, thing has to be turned down so that you can hear it, but not too loud. Otherwise, we get feedback. From it. Got you. Hold on a second. Yeah, okay. I think another thing I might do here is if I get feedback from you, what I'll do is I'm going to click on muting your audio, uh, and then that way the, uh, I won't, uh, you won't be able to speak unless I unmute it. Okay? So whenever it's time for you to talk, then I'm going to unmute your button, okay? But let's go on for right now. First of all, this is Brother Mitchell Blankoff, who just joined us. And uh, a lot of you have probably heard me talk about uh, Mitch uh, in some of my videos and my conversations with you. Uh, his channel is simply named Mitchell Blankoff. And uh, Mitch has some uh, great insights. As a matter of fact, I have a playlist called, uh, I think it's titled uh, Brother Mitch Interesting Insights. He seems to see things in the scriptures that most of us miss. So I think you're going to be really blessed uh, to hear his uh, viewpoints on all these subjects. I'm really, really happy that uh, he was able to make this happen. Now, what I'm going to do is, uh, first, the whole program, the subject is based upon this quote. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Now think about that. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Now, a good way of understanding what this means is, uh, this is also a quote, I don't know who said it, but it says, it is almost as if the characters in the Old Testament are acting out of play, the meaning of which they are completely unaware. It is only the audience to the play, those who watch in light of solid knowledge of the New Testament, who understand the meaning of the words and events in this play. Uh, I think a scripture, uh, uh, something in the New Testament that kind of makes this point is when Paul refers to things that are hidden and a mystery. So if you've heard the Apostle Paul referring to the mystery and hidden things, that's what we're going to discuss in this series here. The Old Testament, things that are hidden that you couldn't understand unless you understand the New Testament, and then it all makes sense. So, Brother Mitch, I'm going to summarize the last two hours that we did in the last episode in about two minutes as quickly as I possibly can, and then we're going to continue on from that point. Okay? Um, first of all, we quoted several verses where Jesus said the Old Testament scriptures were talking about him. And then we also quoted the Apostle Paul saying that when he, he was preaching, 
he, everything he was saying from the Old Testament was talking about Jesus. So we have Paul and Jesus making the point that the Old Testament really is about this Savior that would be coming. Uh, we also discussed um, the idea that uh, in the Garden of Eden you had two trees. You had the tree of life, and we, uh, by the way, I mentioned last time that I got this concept from Brother Mitch in uh, one of his videos, so he, he made this point, and I think this is a very valid point. The, the tree of life in the uh, Garden of Eden is symbolic of Jesus Christ because Jesus' life, Jesus Christ is eternal life, and he was hung on a tree. So the tree of life is symbolic of Jesus Christ giving us eternal life because he died on that tree, that, that cross. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil um, is symbolic of the, the understanding of right and wrong, the understanding of sin or the law. So that the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would be symbolic of the law. So on one hand you have the law, and on the other hand you have the grace and salvation through faith in, in uh, Jesus for eternal life. Uh, now we, ha we have uh, uh, a few things that we covered that were symbolic of this, making this point, and that is the first example we found was the idea that Adam and Eve, uh, after they sinned and they realized they were naked, they attempted to remedy the problem through their own works. They covered themselves with fig leaves. And that wasn't sufficient because Men cannot solve these problems. We need God to solve the problem for us. So God uh, covered them with animal skin. And this is the first example of any death in the Bible. So as far as we know, the first time anything died is the time God killed an animal and there was the shedding of blood necessary so that he could cover the Adam and Eve uh, and this is symbolic of us being covered with the blood of Jesus for our salvation. We have another example of this with Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain made an offering to God that was the works of his hand from what he produced as a farmer. And that was God was not satisfied with that. But Abel offered God a bloody sacrifice, the, the death of uh, his flock. And that satisfied God. God was pleased because God requires the shedding of blood. And these are all pictures of the fact that we are not able to, uh, through our own labors, satisfy God and solve the problem, the problem between man and God, this barrier. We need God to solve the problem, and he does that with the shedding of the blood of the Son. And then we have an uh, example of... Um, Abraham and Isaac. Now, Isaac is referred to his only son. So this is symbolic of representing Jesus Christ as the only son of God. And, and then we have, if he was offered, going to offer his son as a burnt offering. The burnt offering refers to the wrath of God coming down on Jesus Christ. Uh, fire represents the wrath. That's what Brother Ronnie said last time. And then when, when Isaac was laid upon that wood, that's symbolic of Jesus Christ being laid upon the wooden cross. And it says, God will provide himself a lamb. So God provided a lamb, but when it says he will provide himself a lamb, I believe that means he will provide himself as a lamb. He provided himself. God became a man. He became the lamb of God who would die for our sins. So these are all uh, pictures of the future death on the cross for our sins. Uh, and then when the ram that God provided for the sacrifice in, in place of Isaac, it was caught in the thicket by his horns, that represents the thorn, uh, the crown of thorns that Jesus was placed on Jesus' head. And as Brother Salam said, the thorns represent death because death came into the world and it not only was it the fall of man but the fall of the world we had thorns to deal with. Um, and now I guess that's enough of a, a, a recap of the first one. Well, let's move on now and now we're going to talk about Joseph. Oh, but first before I move on, uh, let me ask Salam since he was with us last time. Uh, is there anything I said 
or anything that I left out. Oh, I did. We didn't cover Noah. So, Brother Salam, why don't you discuss Noah for a moment here? I know you talked about the pitch uh, being made of blood and mud. That was very interesting. Yep. Um, um, I've, you know, Noah. Noah is one of my favorite Old Testament char characters because I feel, um, in many uh, respects, he was. He teaches us a lot about patience and about what it means to serve the Lord in a wicked uh, generation. And I mean, for you, brother Luke, you you live you live in Las Vegas, which I mean, if it's anything like London, it's just a a heathen society, you know. And to be preaching the word and to be warning people that judgment is coming. I mean, you know. So that's why I like Noah, but um. He himself, I mean, the the ark itself is such a beautiful picture of um, salvation of Christ. The fact that there was only one door on that ark, and um, it was God that closed that door. Same way as there's only one door of salvation, that's through Jesus Christ, and it's God who seals you. It's God who saves you. It's not yourself. Um, it wasn't Noah who sealed himself. No, God shut that door. And the very ark itself, um, it was built, if I remember, from gopher wood. But the Bible makes it clear that it was um, it was covered with slime and pitch. And I mean, slime and pitch is mixed with blood. If you look at what um, it was made out of, it would have had to be made of blood to give it that kind of sticky substance, that kind of rough stuff, substance to go on the outside of it to protect the water from going through the cracks and just um, that's how that's a great picture as well how we are covered in the blood you know and it's the blood that cleanses us from our sins and it's the one that keeps us saved it, it kind of um, coats us you know it, it, it coats us and it, it, it keeps us saved it's the blood of Christ and I mean I also mentioned there were quite a few things I mentioned but even the fact that whilst they were in the ark I'm sure when when the waves came down and uh, you know the fountains broke up, the deep um, broke up, and the water swelled, that the the ark would have been knocked back and forth, and people in the ark, the animals, no one, and his family would have been knocked down or pushed around, but they still would have been in the ark. There was no way of coming out of it, and it's the same way with us when we're saved. We go through trials which knock us down, you know, we go through periods where like we're defeated but we're still saved, you know, we're still in that ark, we're still sealed, you know, so we shouldn't question our salvation because we're sealed just like how they were sealed in that ark and so there were just loads of things about Noah but is it now, great. One, a great... One thing that I'll add to that before we move off that subject is the idea that Noah preached for 120 years, and he called out to everyone, uh, whosoever wants to come into the ark could come in. So it's the same as the message of our salvation today. Whosoever will believe in the Lord Jesus will be saved. Uh, now, uh, before we go on to any of the new topics here, new parts of this, I want to ask Brother Mitch and also Tanya uh, to just kind of give any insights to what we've covered briefly so far, and then we'll move on. Let's start. Uh, Mitch, uh, go ahead, and I'm going to see how your microphone's working. And then take a few minutes, and if there's anything that you want to add to what we just said, go ahead and do that, please. You got to unmute. Okay. Okay, you're okay now. Okay, I unmuted. Go ahead. There you go. I got it. All right. You got me? I unmuted you. Go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, looking at, at, at the beginning and the end, from the beginning and the end um, of all this, the, 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 the beginning of the New Testament all the way up through the, through, through the, uh, you know, the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, we had uh, a, a people that were blinded to the, to the entire message. So in other words, while the Bible was being written, they didn't see the picture that was being put together. And as a matter of fact, they were blinded to it, so that when Messiah came, they rejected even the Messiah, that, that, that the picture of their scriptures so clearly painted for them. 
so that that to me is um, if, if you're going to talk about something that that, that kind of confirms uh, the the Bible itself, it, it's the it's the fact that these people wrote this story, and th their history is the story that te that that tells of the coming of the Messiah, and it was even foretold that they didn't or weren't able to see it. They were blinded to that truth. So if, that, if, if there's a comment, that, that would be my most striking thing about the whole, the whole um, scenario from, from the beginning of, uh, of Genesis all the way up into the New Testament. Okay. Uh, if you're finished, then let me make a comment on what you just said there. I'm going to mute you for a second. If you want to say something again, wave your hand and I'll get my attention. I'm going to unmute. I'm only muting just because you avoid feedback from the mics. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, oops. There you go. Uh, the the idea again when we discussed it this first time, I didn't relate what Paul had said, but it dawned on me today that this is the answer to Paul's claim that these things were mysterious before the, the mystery that people want to keep talking about, Paul's mystery gospel, and this really explains that the whole subject of all these shadows and pictures of the future that they didn't understand back then. It was hidden. Uh, but now the, the truth's going to come out in this study, and you're going to see how clear it was. As we look back, we can see it clearly. But when in their time, it was kind of hidden and mysterious. They didn't get it. Okay? Uh, Tanya, what do you want to say before we continue? Uh, okay. uh, Go ahead. Brother Lee, Ta Tanya's husband is um, hoovering or vacuuming, as you guys say, in the States. So oh. if you would get her. Hey, Brother Ron. Okay, Brother Ron, hi. Stop vacuuming. Hi, Ron. Here you are. Hi there. Uh, you hear me now? Yeah, I got you unmuted. Okay. Okay, uh, Ron, we just did a little recap of the first study that we did last right. week. And we're moving on now, so welcome for everybody who's watching. This is uh, Brother Ron. His channel on YouTube is Duck4212. That's D-U-C-K-4212. I hope you subscribe to his channel. Uh, okay, so it, uh, I understand correctly, Salam, that uh, Tanya is not available to comment right now, right? I think she is now. I am now. My okay. husband was vacuuming earlier. But honestly, I don't really have anything to add. Um, just yet, because I, I missed the first Bible study, so I'm listening for now. Okay. I've got a few notes I took when I read uh, some of Leviticus, but um, I guess we can get to that later once we get into this more. But I really okay. like what Mitch had to say. All cool. right, now we're going to take a look at Joseph. Uh, you know, the people who haven't studied the Bible must they think of Joseph as, you know, the coat of many colors, and they get a, a musical play about it, and... Now, the world, that's all they know about Joseph, but we know who studied the Bible, Joseph is, there's a lot more to it than that. And uh, so, first let me just read this verse here. Genesis 45, 4. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Now I have an idea of what I want to talk about on that verse, but before I uh, tell you what I'm thinking, uh, let me hear, first of all, um, somebody kind of just lay a brief foundation of what happened with Joseph as he got sold into slavery and went to Egypt. So who, who would like to take that on just for a minute and lay that foundation? Okay, Mitch, go ahead. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, you're on. Okay, uh, as far as I see with, with Joseph, um, Joseph was the dreamer. He had been um, the 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 favored child of um, of Jacob's uh, um, favored wife Ra Rachel, Rachel or Rachel, and so um, and then there was Leah, the the the, the children of Leah. And uh, so the children of Leah and the children of of of, of Rachel, there was a, a bit of enmity between be, between the, the brothers and sisters here. And so what had happened was Joseph had said that he had a dream, that he that the, that he was 
he was exalted above them. He was like the moon and the, and the stars bowed down to him. You know, and here the brothers are going, who is this, uh, who, who do you think you are, Joseph, right? So now, now um, they're pretty mad, and then he gets a coat of many colors. A robe is put, a king's robe is put upon him. And then we look at Jesus Christ. He came, right? And, and, and he's saying to the people that I'm exalted, and the Pharisees and the people said, who are you, Jesus? Right? And, and so then they plotted to have him, have him thrown in a well, Joseph thrown in a well, where they actually they crucified Jesus Christ. And this is a picture of the Jews you know, rejecting their Messiah. And then at the end, the chosen, the, the, the chosen people who, you know, who had crucified him, and that's everybody. All of us have rejected Messiah until we see, until our eyes are open and we see who the Messiah is. At the end, he, he will be exalted and we will be bowing down, of course, to Jesus Christ, just as the brothers bowed down and were forgiven by Jesus Christ. So it, it is a it, it, it's a marvelous picture. That's all I really want to say about that. So yes, okay, that's a very good uh, example. There's a little bit more to the story. Uh, he was sold into slavery, and then he became a slave and a servant. But God blessed him, and he ended up becoming the right hand man. He stood on the right hand of Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. Uh, he was the second most powerful, and he was able to. Um, save not only Egypt, but the whole area because of a famine. Uh, he had a vision from God about how to solve that problem. And because of his decision, uh, the, his brothers and his father and his family were able to come to Egypt and be saved. And that's what he was saying when he said to his brothers, when he divulged who he was, he said, God did send me before you to preserve life. So... Joseph being sold into slavery, being put in that well, and being becoming a slave, and then advancing to the right hand of the Pharaoh was all part of God's plan to preserve life. Because otherwise, starvation would have killed uh, uh, Jacob's whole family, and uh, you know the, the line of Abraham, uh, you know, would have ended. So, now uh, let's move on to uh, Brother Ron. Is there anything you want to say about this? Not really right at the moment. I'm trying to get everything fixed right here. I'm still having some problems, technical problems. Okay, and if, if you do want to talk at any point, just wave your hand, get my attention, and okay, I'll call on you, okay? Brother Salam, what have you got to say about this so far? About Joseph? Yes. Uh, there's, uh, there's so much to say about Joseph, but, um, yeah, it's funny how, um, you know, his, his initial dream that he had, you know, of of um, you know, of his brothers and um, his even his parents, you know, their their sheaves bowing bowing down to him. Um, he never he never let go of that dream, and even though he went through so much, he came out the other side a man. I mean, he left a boy, but by the time we um, we meet him in Egypt, and he's the second most powerful man. In Egypt, we see him as a man, and we see his dream uh, fulfilled. And you know, and it, and it just shows you when, when you know, when when God is in something, um, it will come to fruition. It doesn't matter how long it takes or what trials you go through. Eventually, what God has said will come to pass. You know. So I mean, there's I mean, there's so much you can say about Joseph, but that's just. All right, I've got a couple of things I'm going to add, but first let me see if Tanya wants to comment at this point. Uh, I would just say that I, I'm agreeing with what everybody said, and um, somebody may have already said this. Sorry, I'm putting a pacifier in my baby's mouth. Um, about Joseph, so forgive me if this was already said, but what comes to mind when I think of Joseph's story is like what how Jesus says he goes to prepare a place for us, and that's kind of like what he did for his brothers, um, even though he didn't know it at the time. But um, that's kind of what he did. And then um, being a, it's, it's like Joseph thought ahead, you know, like how he saved all of that food the way he did. 
um, he thought ahead, just like how Jesus did when, you know, we sinned and there was a way for us to go to heaven through him. God thought of all of it. So that's all I'll add. Okay. Let me make a couple of points and then you guys can comment on this. Uh, Joseph was betrayed and sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was also betrayed and sold by one of his apostles for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, also, Jesus was taken into Egypt uh, just as, as Joseph was, uh, was uh, taken into Egypt. Uh, Jesus was taken into Egypt to protect him from the jealousy of Herod, and Joseph was taken into Egypt because of the jealousy of his brothers who would have killed him. Uh, let's look at Matthew 2, 14 and 15. It says, When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So you can see there's a parallel that Joseph and Jesus were cast off or had to go to Egypt. So, uh, Brother Mitch, you want to say a comment about anything, that, any of these points? Well, there isn't, there isn't too much more that I can um, add to it. Um, there are these, these parallels between, um, between Christ and, and Joseph, and they're, and they're obvious how he came from Egypt and, 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 and then came back to, to uh, um, you know, Jerusalem to, to, to you know, deliver uh, back to the land where, where he's going to deliver his people. Which is kind of like Joseph when he when, when he went to Egypt, but then he saved the people. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't see too many more. I mean, I can I can elaborate on every little detail, but I, I really think that the it, it's pretty clear and obvious from from what we've read so far or or seen so far that that Joseph is is a clear picture of, of Jesus Christ. Let me read one more verse and see if this kind of stimulates another idea for it. Then, okay, Genesis thirty-seven thirty-four. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. So we have uh, Jacob being told that his son was dead. We know that he was thrown into that well. And ja Jacob mourned for Joseph, believing he was dead. And then we know that there was a reunion later, and he was actually alive. Jacob got to see his son, Joseph. So when we look at him being going into the well, and then we look at him alive, and we look at J Jacob mourning for his son, thinking he was dead, what does that bring to mind? Tanya's giddy. She's giddy. She wants to say something. She wants to say something. Let, 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 her, let, let her talk. I mean, what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at the, even the idea of the well. Jesus, the well, the spring of life. Uh, that, 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 uh, that um, okay, you, okay, you got the same thing I did then, right? Yeah, when he mentioned the well, and, and, and you know, barring the idea that Jacob we, was weeping for Christ, was, uh, was that a picture of the Father or was that a picture of Israel? You know, it's kind of hard to to, 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 to to draw those correlations that way. But obviously, yes, uh, God had seen His Son uh, die on the cross, and then got, and then He was resurrected. And also, the people of Israel, I don't I don't know that they they wept, but but they you know they they looked upon Christ and 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 um, anybody who sees Jesus for who He is has, has actually rejoiced. But but yeah, there there would be a uh, um, there would be a verse that I would parallel with that in Zechariah. It was at 12.10 where it says, They will look upon the one that they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as, an, a, a, as for an only son. I mean, okay. those are some of the things. I think th those are all valid points, and, and I, I hadn't thought of the water being like the living water, uh, but can anybody see a, a, a similarity between put into a well and being put into a tomb? And coming out of the well and coming out of the tomb alive. What, yes. What's that a picture of? 
of uh, of course Christ's uh, res resurrection. He yes, died. Yes, yes. Three, days three, day, three nights later, he rose again. It's it's the picture of the death. They 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 told his father that Joseph was dead, and he was buried in that well. But he as, was alive. Uh, when his father thought he was alive, it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection right there. Exactly. Everybody thought he was dead, but he wasn't. And then everybody re saw and found out that he was alive. And yeah, that's exactly Jesus. <laughs> mm -hmm. The fact so, that he ruled Egypt uh, later on is, is also the more of it, too. I didn't hear that, brother. What? He became a ruler after he went to Egypt, which is, I think, it's very similar to Jesus ruling after the after it comes back uh, after the tribulation. I can see that, but I can also see that he's the right hand man of, of uh, Pharaoh, and right now he's the right hand man of the Father. He's sitting on the right, right hand on the throne. Yep. Um, but uh, one thing that uh, I mentioned very briefly that I think is uh, important understanding is that uh, in Joseph's case, he was the savior of a physical. physical provided some kind of physical salvation. He saved them from starvation. Not only his father and his brothers, but the whole population around there. And Jesus is a savior, a spiritual savior. So they're both saviors in that respect. But to me, the, the thick part that gets me the most is being going into the well, being told that he was dead, and then coming out of the well, and he, like the picture of the resurrection in front of the tomb. All right, unless someone wants to say more, we're going to move on to Moses now. I was going to say quickly, um, it was um, it was Judah's idea in, in Genesis chapter 37, it was Judah's idea to sell Joseph into Egypt. Now in the New Testament, Judah is translated Judas, so that's like... You know, that's a very interesting parallel as well. Because Jude, wow. Jude in, in the New Testament is Judas. And so it's like, well, Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces. And Judah, which is the Old Testament spelling of Judas, was the one who suggested they sell Joseph. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. That's something we, we, we missed. But uh, I wasn't really even uh, aware of which of the brothers. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. No, nothing is, uh, nothing is coincidental. Yeah, there's a lot of coincidences in this Bible, aren't there? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go look at Moses now, but let's first look at 1 Corinthians 10.1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now all these things happen unto them, for example, and they are written for our admonition. So, this is Paul, as he was known to do, pointing to the scriptures to teach us what they really meant, the hidden meaning. So, uh, if everybody has that in front of them, you might want to read that and, and see any, any key points, though, that you want to uh, uh, elaborate on. On this. That's verses 1, 2, 3, and 11 is what I read. Brother, what chapter was that? Real quick, I'm looking at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 10, okay. And again, uh, for everybody who's watching, uh, this is the Apostle <coughs> Paul who wrote the book 1 Corinthians. And Paul is the one that kept alluding to the examples. The, uh, what was the word Salam he used uh, in that last study, we talked about what Paul said in the word that was so important. Um, you mean uh, shadows? 
types? Yeah, but uh, Paul used a particular word that I thought was really important. Uh, I'll find it here. Yeah, Paul was talking about Isaac and Ishmael. He used that example there also. Oh, and uh, and and sample. Yes, sample. Um, Is that the word? I believe so. Um, I think it's in, in Galatians four twenty one and so on. Well, I, I don't know. I don't want to waste too much time looking for it. But the point is that this is another point where Paul is talking about the scriptures and all these events of the past and explaining to the to people the real significance of it. And that's exactly what we're doing today. We're looking at all these things and trying to understand the real significance of all these events. Hey, Brother Mitch? Yeah, are we speaking more about Hebrews chapter 10 than, than, than the Corinthians chapter 10? Because in Hebrews chapter 10, now we're talking about the shadows of the things to come. In, uh, in the Corinthians chapter 10, this is talking about, um, uh, Paul had mentioned in, uh, that, that all things are permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial. In other words, we don't want to mix the, the cup of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Jesus' blood with the cup of demons. If we're saved, we should, we should live a life that's, that's holy, but, but, but then, then again, all things are permissible for Paul, which means they're permissible, but that doesn't mean that they're, they're very good for us. Mm -hmm. So that's more, I think, the gist of, uh, of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. But if we flip over to Hebrews chapter 10, now we're talking about shadows of the things to come and the priestly sacrifices and all this. So I yeah. don't know if that's where you were, you were looking to go. Well, I, I think we're going to be covering Hebrews, more of Hebrews a little bit later but this particular part of, of 1 Corinthians, the main thing I wanted to discuss was this whole idea about Moses and the, the sea and the, uh, the cloud. Okay, let me read it again and see if you see anything here that's significant you want to talk about here. Um, I would not that ye be, should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized, unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we, see, we definitely see a, a picture of uh, the Israelites um, being under the blood of Christ. And this is all from right from uh, um, Moses' deliverance, which you, if you really want to get into the plagues and the refuting of all the the, the gods of, of of Pharaoh and the gods and, and and all the other gods were were refuted, and then the one god with the lamb, the blood of the lamb, uh, being put over the doorposts, and then the deliverance through the sea, and then and then the being sped, fed by the spiritual uh, uh, rock, uh, Jesus Christ. And we see a picture of us being delivered from all of the false gods and the uh, all of, all of the idolatry, and the only one way is through the blood of Christ for our salvation in our Christian walk, and then and then we all eat of the same spiritual spiritual rock, Jesus Christ. So that, that that's also a, a picture of it's a picture of the Jews, it's a picture of the the Exodus, and it's a picture of the Christian walk. Okay. Uh, the when it says that uh, when you were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, now we know the Red Sea was opened up. We know the Jews were allowed to pass through that sea and escape Egypt. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud. Now was there some baptism ceremony uh, that what took place that day or what? Well, I was going to mention that because I'm seeing two distinct things here. I'm seeing the cloud, and then the, and I'm seeing the sea, and then I'm seeing um, that they were baptized in the sea, or in the cloud, and in the sea, and I'm seeing they had spiritual food and spiritual drink. Um, does the cloud mean judgment? Because that's what I 
thought it, it means when it's mentioned in the Old Testament. Is that true? Like, what does the cloud mean in, in this? In this case, what was the cloud that was overhead? Oh, yeah. that was God, right? Yeah. By name. Oh, okay. At this time, didn't didn't God provide a cloud of of, of uh, was it was it smoke or fire or just a cloud that they fire at night them. that led them fire at night cloud during the day that would be a picture of the Holy Spirit leading them. Okay, so here we have the cloud as they're representing the Spirit leading them, and then they go through the sea, and that's the picture of Paul. Paul even used the word baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So this is symbolic of our future. When we get baptized, we get baptized into Christ, and this going through the Red Sea is a picture of that. And now we, he refers to spiritual meat. What was the spiritual meat? Manna. Yes. So. And quail. The quail. God provided quail for them, right? And what's the meat? The meat uh, that Jesus provided us. Uh, he provided us um, what he, I mean, his salvation, though he's, he's the bread of life. But what's the meat? His, his body. body is the flesh. Yeah. Okay? So the quail was the meat. Jesus represents the meat, the flesh that was provided. And, and then we get to spiritual drink. Uh, they drank from a rock. Remember, Moses struck on the rock to get water out. So they got spiritual uh, spiritual drink water from that rock, and what is the rock represent? Paul even says, doesn't it? That right. rock was Christ. So Moses and striking that rock is a picture of Jesus Christ being struck. And remember when what came out when Jesus was struck? Blood and water from his side. So Moses struck the rock, and water came out. Jesus' side was struck and pierced, and water came out along with blood. Uh, so Paul, you know, he's not really uh, making this, like, mysterious. You know, he's explaining. He said, look, the rock represents Christ. Jesus is the rock of our foundation. He's the rock. Back then, the rock was what Moses struck to get the water so they could live. Jesus provides living water for us today. Uh, let's, let's look at Numbers 2010. Uh, 2010 through uh, 12. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. To them. Given them. Okay. So here's the reference to Moses striking this rock. But uh, he struck the rock. God said, if you strike the rock, you'll get water. What did Moses do, though? He smote the rock twice. He hit it twice. Did God tell him to strike it more than once, or he just said strike it? Yeah, strike it once. So what is the difference between striking it once and striking it twice, then? Lack of faith. Or would it be straight up disobedience? It's kind of the works of Moses' hand. Well, wait Moses. a minute. That would be crucifying him all over again. Crucifying that him would be again? To crucify Christ all over. That would be that would be to say that 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 wasn't good enough. Yes, exactly right. Once is good enough, and once symbolizes Jesus being struck in the side and the water coming out. That's a perfect picture. Moses spoiled the picture by striking it twice. And because of that, what did, what, did Moses, what did Moses suffer? Because he struck it twice. He took his own initiative. He, he did the works of his own hand with that second strike. Just as 
Adam and Eve tried to do the, solve the problem by covering themselves with all of these. Just as, just as Cain tried to do the works of his hand, providing an offering through his farming. But no, God has his own way he wants things done, and he doesn't want man to come up with his own way of doing it. God has a, the solution, and he told Moses, strike the rock. He didn't say keep striking it. You know, they well. just need to strike it once. Still yeah. boils down to lack of faith, though, the same thing. It's the, the reason he struck the rock twice is because he doubted, or he thought he could do it. He, he had to do something. <laughs> no, God didn't do it all. I'll, I'll have to strike it another time to help God out here. That's right. Mm -hmm. I would um, I would like to say, um, you know, God, God had told Moses um, in the book of Exodus, chapter 17, um, you know, that, you know, because cause in Numbers 20, this is the second time um, God is going to provide water out of a rock. But he told him actually the first time in Exodus 17, he tells Moses here in verse 5 of chapter 17 of Exodus, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take thee of the elders of Israel, and thy word wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee, Upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the south with the elders of Israel. So what's interesting is um, in Exodus 17, God had told Moses, strike the rock. In Numbers 20, the passage we're reading now, God actually tells Moses to speak to the rock in verse 18. He says, um, he says in verse 8, Take the word, gather thou the assembly together, and Aaron and thy brethren speak ye unto the rock before their rising, and shall give forth his water. So what Moses actually did was the, the, the error was not in striking it twice. The error was striking it in the first place because God told him, speak to the rock. Don't hit it because in Horeb, you know, all those months back, you hit the rock once, and that's that's all that was needed. Christ only needed to die once. Now, now, whenever I tell you to do this again, you're going to speak to the rock. <coughs> Why? Because it's already been been hit twice. It's already been hit once, and so Moses disobeys by actually hitting it twice instead of speaking to it. You know? Okay, that's very good. Very good. That's much better. Uh getting a whole thing in context. I wasn't yeah. aware of the first incident, but that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, next week, yeah next week, I, I, wanted to, I just wanted to, 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 to just draw this, con uh, this, this correlation a little bit more um, clearly between the Jews going back to the law and the striking of the rock twice. The idea that, 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 that Christianity, Judaism, seems to want to go back to work salvation in order to in order to crucify again, and this is I think what was being spoken about uh, about uh, in Hebrews when it talked about when if, if, if you're going to you're going to if you you know sin again and, and this sin was disbelief or, or not trusting in Christ for your salvation, what you do is you crucify all all over again or strike the rock twice as Moses did, and so now Moses can't reach go into the promised land. Uh, it was Joshua, Yeshua, who led them into the promise. Was this is this is a foreshadowing, because because the, the 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 Jews of that age were striking the rock twice, just as the Jews in the in the time of Christ, who accepted Christ, just like these Pharisaical Jews who accepted Christ, but didn't accept Christ because they were still striking that rock twice. Yeah, very good. That's exactly the, I think the problem that God was. Uh, uh, he wasn't happy with it in that case. He's certainly not happy with people doing it again because, as, as uh, Paul said, he nullified the grace of God uh, by by trying to insinuate or believe that his, his death for our sins somehow is not sufficient. There's something that you've got to do. But no, God did it all. We just need to have faith in what he did. Uh, but I think, Brother Salam, the idea of, of uh, uh, striking it twice, let me, let me re kind of after what you've added to this conversation, let me say that I think the error was striking it on two occasions. He struck it the first time, on the first occasion he was supposed to, 
On the second occasion, he wasn't supposed to strike it at all, so he struck it again. And it's the same kind of thing whether he struck it two times right at once, or he struck it the first time correctly, and then later on he, he was only supposed to speak to it. He wasn't supposed to strike it again, keep striking it. So, uh, all right, I'm going to move on unless someone has something else to say about that situation. Yeah. Let's look at... Uh, Oh, I mentioned this already, John 10:34. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. So this is the picture that I see that is representative of that hitting, striking the rock, and the water coming out. Uh, and now we'll look at John 7:37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Um, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Uh, we're still relating this to Moses. So Moses provided water, and Jesus provides water. But the one is, again, it's a physical thing. Just like Joseph provided physical salvation, he provided food so they could live and not starve, and Moses provided water, and he provided also bread, God did it. But, uh, there was bread to eat, there was water to drink, there was quails to eat. This was for their physical salvation. And But yet, what Jesus was providing for us, these things are all for our spiritual salvation, rather than the physical. All right. Um, and let's look at John 6, 32-35. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Uh, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. So, here we have three things. Uh, we have flesh, we have bread, we have water. All at the time of Moses in the wilderness. And then we have flesh, being Jesus' death, uh, body being killed. We have his blood being shed. We have the, uh, the bread of life. And we have the living water. So anybody want to talk about any of those things before I uh, I'm going to kind of do a more complete comparison side by side here in a second, but before I move on. Uh, so that verse also points out uh, eternal salvation, too. You can't lose it. Where is that? When you're talking about he shall never thirst. And he that believe of me shall never thirst. Okay. Never. You'll never hunger, never thirst. Yeah. That's so, a, yeah. another another way of, of understanding our eternal security. Okay, so I'm going to just make a point, uh, and then any, any one of these points anybody wants to talk about, it'll then just go ahead and start speaking. Pharaoh tried to kill Moses. Herod tried to kill Jesus. Moses, in uh, Moses' case, was called by God to leave Egypt. In Jesus' case, he was carried out of, uh, out into Egypt to escape uh, Herod. Well, Moses was 40 years in the wilderness to prepare for his ministry. And in Jesus' case, what, was he, what did he do to prepare for his ministry? Forty days. 
in the 40, days, 40 days in the wilderness to prepare for Jesus. Moses left his position with the king of Egypt to dwell with the Jews. Jesus left to the right hand of the Father uh, to live with the Jews. Uh, Moses led Israel out of slavery in Egypt, and Jesus leads spiritual Israel out of sin. Aaron prepared the way for Moses. John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus. In Moses' case, they were baptized Israel in the Red Sea in order to free them. As they passed through that Red Sea, Paul compared it to a baptism get their freedom. And in Jesus, uh, in Jesus' case, we think of baptism uh, as our uh, symbolic of our uh, salvation. Uh, our, our sin not being a barrier between us and God. In Moses' case, he gave uh, manna in the wilderness. Uh, bread came down from the sky. But in Jesus' case, he gives us the spiritual bread to all who hunger. Moses gave the water to the people in the desert. Jesus gives spiritual water. And Moses spoke to God on Mount Sinai. Jesus spoke to God on Mount Hermon. Um, these are, uh, this is just a parallel side by side to see that Moses, in many ways, was a picture of Christ. But Moses was always providing this physical salvation and providing this the end game for Moses and his people was to get to the promised land. But what was the end game for us with Jesus for us to get to our promised land which is not a physical promised land it's our uh, eternal life in the kingdom of God. Alright, I'm going to move on to another thing with Moses here but we've, uh, I gave you a lot to consider. Does anybody want to elaborate on any of those points? Do you think any of them are not valid, or are they good comparisons? How do you correlate Moses murdering the Egyptian to anything Christ did? Well, I, that wasn't on the list. I, I wouldn't compare that. Uh, well, I'm just saying that the, there are differences, but I just I was curious if there was some kind of parallel. In that case, uh, he's more like David, and more like Paul, Saul of Tarsus, as far as being a murderer. Uh, we talked about that in a previous study that the, the great uh, people of, of the Bible who committed the horrible sins, you know, of murder, adultery, and, and so on. And here where they are, Moses and David, and the Apostle Paul, we, we think that these are the greatest figures of, of historical, uh, historical figures in the Bible, and yet we see some of the greatest examples of sin from them. I think I have something to, to elaborate yes. on that that point with the with the with the with the, with the um, Egyptian soldier. He was uh, he was beating on a on a Jewish slave at the time. And if you think about it, uh, here here he is Moses stands between an an Egyptian beating uh, the the slave Jew and helping the Jew. And what do the Jews do in return? They pointed out that Jesus was a that, that not Jesus, but Moses was was a murderer. So here he is trying to help them out, right? <laughs> and he gets he gets hammered for it. Very true, very true. Ron, did you get, did you follow that? Oh yeah, I hear it. Yeah, it's just, it's it. you can you can come up with a lot of it going on there. I, I think it's uh, uh, pretty much that uh, also that that even though Moses might be a type. You know, or close to being, uh, uh, it is different. He's human. <laughs> he's he's a, like we all are. In other words, the, oh, yeah. there's only one Christ. Even though we can compare Moses uh, to Christ, we can compare, you know, uh, uh, Joseph to Christ. You know, uh, there's still only one Christ, though. And we can all say amen to that. Let's look at Numbers 21:8. Um, it says, "And the Lord said unto Moses." Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made his serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. 
And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Who's going to jump on that one? How many people you think looked at the serpent? I think everybody got bitten ran to that serpent to look at it. <laughs> Yeah, it really, that's a good point, uh, because it's the good news is so good that anybody who hears it should immediately say, I want to go to look at that serpent, you know. Uh, but, you know but, they, but today we don't see that kind of um, people flooding and running to the cross like I'm sure they ran to that brass serpent. Okay, but uh, now we haven't discussed, you know, what the real true meaning of this is brass serpent on the pole is, so who wants to elaborate on that? What is, um, what is is referred to in John chapter 3, of course, when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, and he refers back to this, just like how Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And I mean, this is like the quintessential um, gospel message and I mean I think I, I think that one picture encapsulates how easy it is to be saved because in order for you to just look at something does not take any work on your part you're not doing anything the work has already been done the brass serpent has already been made you know we have to just look and it's the same thing just by faith we trust that uh, we trust Christ to save us from our sins. Now, what I always found interesting is that um, it was a brass serpent, you know, and it's the serpents themselves that were stinging the people. So it's almost like that picture of the brass serpent being lifted up is like Christ becoming sin for us. The cause of the problems in the camp was the sin. Sin was in the camp, and therefore these fiery serpents was judgment. And obviously brass, all the way through the Bible, brass is always seen as judgment, you know. God, God said many times that he would turn the, the skies into brass skies, and like the ground into brass so um, crops won't grow. It's a sign of judgment. So the fact that it was a brass serpent was that Christ becoming sin for us the very judgment that was used to judge the people was now the one that would save them, i.e. sin was what was used to judge. Christ became sin for us. That's why he was molded into a serpent, or that's why it had to be a serpent. He became sin for us in order that we might be saved. So I see it's a very, very powerful um, story, and you know the parallels with Christ. I mean, I'm talking... And I'm going back and forth because it's so similar. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, Brother Ron mentioned a minute ago that, that Moses was not a perfect uh, picture of Christ. And uh, that, that's true. Uh, but in this case, uh, I believe this is a perfect picture. But I remember years ago, I used to wonder why... We would, we would think of Jesus as this serpent on the cross. Why was Jesus being com made comparable to a serpent? And I think I know the answer, but rather than me saying, anybody want to elaborate more on that? Uh, I mean, I think of Jesus on the cross, and then I think of serpent on the pole. I think that's pretty insulting to Jesus, to compare him to a serpent. No, but that's what he was, right? He was sin for us, right? He was the rock that the 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 the, the, the stabbing in the side and the and, and 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 the rock that we were speaking about. Moses was was the picture of judgment, was he not? So he was the picture of the one with the Ten Commandments, the one with the the, the judgment judging the rock, not us. Uh, and and also with these pictures of the of that that Moses isn't a perfect picture. I don't. I never thought that the Bible was a perfect picture, and as a matter of fact, I think that the, the Bible can't be a perfect picture because, in that way, those who would be blinded would be blinded. It's a mystery, and so so I think that they, that, that 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 you can see it, but I don't think that that that, that it's going to be so plain 
you know, it is plain when you really look at it, uh, but, but I don't think every single detail is like a perfect detail. And there might be reasons for things that, and mysteries that, that, that God hasn't even revealed to us until we get to heaven to, to explain all the reasons why Moses murdered this one or this didn't happen exactly the way that happened. But, but it, it, it's just, it just boggles the mind to see as you, as you kind of skip through the Bible, you see all these shadows. Okay, so let me make a comment about what you just said about uh, the idea that um, this is not perfect and there's a reason it's not perfect. Well, is, it there, is this the same reason that Jesus would chose to speak in parables? Why did Jesus choose to speak in parables? There you go. So that would, they would be ever seeing and ever perceiving. Is that Isaiah, it's, it's written in Isaiah. Right. The Jews would, would would not see their Messiah. Yeah, but in other words, the truth is right in front of our eyes, and yet some people can't see it because why? Because their heart is wrong, and they can't see it because they first have to address the, the heart problem. Until they get their heart right, their attitude right, they can't see the, 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 the understanding of the parable. They cannot see it because, oh, they find some flaw in the, um, in the, the picture or the shadow or something. That doesn't make sense. So there's, it's flawed, but because if their heart's not right, then they won't understand the parable. They won't understand I think, the I, 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 is it Tanya over here who wants to speak to you? Oops. Yeah, I, I was just going to say something. Um, yeah. I heard this saying just the other day, uh, Brother Luke, I've been watching that The Restless Church series, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that I remember from that, it said that, there are lots of things to learn and discover through the lens of the gospel. And so now the, since we have the lens of the gospel, we're looking through that, and now we're looking through the Old Testament and all of Scripture, we're able to recognize and see all this awesome stuff. Amen. Which the Jews, unfortunately, you know, the ones who don't believe, they don't got that lens to look yeah. through, so they, they can't see it. And, and um, interpreting the Bible, so it's very common for people to say, you can't start with a presupposition, uh, because then you're going to make the conclusion based upon the presupposition you came with. But I don't think that's correct. I think we do need to start with this presupposition. That's the foundation. Uh, I'm freezing up. Can you all still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, because my video is frozen. But we need, to, we need to start with this presupposition, the foundational premise that um, Jesus is our Savior God. But, you know, and when we start, we start with that and understand that uh, uh, to look at it through that lens, then we can clearly see all these other things. Well, that's got to be revealed before we can look at it through that lens. you got to be right. that Jesus is the God. That, that's the part that... We're not the cop. We can't do it. That's that's where we're getting into striking the rock twice again. That is, you. <laughs> it's, uh, there's a there's a uh, an attitude before a person's even going to believe. Okay, I I heard you, Ron, but I just get a still picture from everybody right now. So I uh, I don't know if you can see the video of me, but for, I, I'm I always, everybody moving. Yeah, okay. I, I I can see you. I can see you. All right. Uh, it says, the following plug-in is unresponsive, unknown. Would you like to stop it, yes or no? no. I wouldn't hit anything, Luke, because you look fine. Video's coming through. You're, coming through, all everything's right. Everything's good. Okay. That button, you won't be. <laughs> all right, well, that's okay. I'm just going to uh, operate. Even though I can't see you, you're going to have to just talk, and I guess we'll have to talk over each other, because I don't know who to acknowledge, so I'll call on right. you. But the point is that... Uh, I do, we do need to look at it through this lens, and when you when you do have the right lens to look back at it all, then you're able to see the true meaning of all these things. Uh, it's like the Rosetta Stone. Yeah, Amen. The, the Rosetta Stone, and uh, or the presupposition that we're saved by faith alone through our faith in the Savior. Uh, now, uh, someone mentioned. I think it was Salam. You mentioned John. Uh, chapter 3, I'm going to read that. It says, yep. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
one thing you said, Salam, we're talking about how easy it is. All you've got to do is look. Okay. Now that to me is a very important for people to understand that um, this idea of easy believism, they want to use it as a um, pejorative term. Like to criticize us who say faith is sufficient, nothing else is required, and they, they want to say call us oh, that's just easy believism or, or uh, what, what the, the greasy grace or whatever the term they use to try to be insulting. But the mm -hmm. point is, uh, looking at it is not really um, what was necessary. They had to believe that looking at it because another say Salam, you told me. All you go, hey, you got bit by the snake. If you go look at the pole, the brass pole with a snake on it, uh, you'll be healed. Yeah. You won't die. And I say, that's stupid. I'm not going to do that. I have to first have faith that, oh,